If you'd asked me upon my graduation from high school where I'd be at 40, and surely someone must have asked, there must be a feature tucked away in the long lost yearbook laying out our plans for later life. I would have painted a blissful picture of the smocked artist at work in her airy studio, the children, several of them aged perhaps five, seven, and nine, frolicking in the sun-dappled garden, doubtless with a dog or two, large ones. I wouldn't have been able to describe for you the source of income for this vision, nor any father to account for the children. Men seemed, at that juncture, incidental to the stuff of life. Nor did the children require a nanny of any kind. They played miraculously well without bickering, without ever the desire to interrupt the artist until she was ready. And then the obligatory and delightful picnic beneath the trees. No money, no man, no help. But in the picture, there were those necessary things, the light, the work, the garden, and crucially, the children. If you'd asked me then to winnow the fantasy, to excise all that was expendable, I would have taken out the picnic and the dogs and the garden and under duress the studio, a kitchen table could suffice for the art, if need be, or an attic, or a garage, but the art and the children, they were not negotiable. I'm not exactly not an artist, and I don't exactly not have children. I've just contrived to arrange things very poorly or very well, depending on how you look at it. I leave the kids when school gets out, I make my art. I don't have to use the kitchen table because I have a whole second bedroom with two windows, no less, for that purpose, evenings and weekends. It's not much, but it's better than nothing. And in the Serena year, when I had my airy studio to share, when I couldn't wait to get there, my veins fizzing at the prospect, it was perfect. I always thought I'd get farther. I'd like to blame the world for what I failed to do. But the failure, the failure that sometimes washes over me as anger makes me so angry I could spit, is all mine in the end. What made my obstacles insurmountable, what consigned me to mediocrity, is me, just me. I thought for so long, forever, that I was strong enough, or I misunderstood what strength was. I thought I could get to greatness, to my greatness, by plugging on, cleaning up each mess as it came, the way you're taught to eat your greens before you have dessert. But it turns out that's a rule for girls and sissies, because the mountain of greens is of Everest proportions, and the bowl of ice cream at the far end of the table is melting a little more with each passing second. There will be ants on it soon, and then they'll come and clear it away altogether. The hubris of it thinking I could be a decent human being and a valuable member of the family and society and still create. Absurd. How strong did I think I was? No, obviously what strength was all along was the ability to say fuck off to the lot of it, to turn your back on all the suffering and contemplate unmolested your own desires above all. Men have generations of practice at this. Men have figured out how to spawn children and leave them to others to raise, how to placate their mothers with a mere phone call from afar, how to insist as calmly as if insisting that the sun is in the sky, as if any other possibility were madness, that their work of all things is what must and must first be done. Such strength has in its youthful vision no dogs or gardens or picnics, no children, no sky. It is focused only on one thing, whether it's on money or on power or on a paintbrush and a canvas. It's a failure of vision. In fact, anyone with half a brain can see that. It's myopia. But that's what it takes. You need to see everything else everyone else, as expendable, as less than yourself. I just, um, a little non-fiction moment. Uh, I remember I lived off <coughs> campus in, uh, in college, and, um, and you know how it is when you're in college, and it's just hard to, to take care of certain practical things, and uh, we didn't have any lights working in our uh, partly because all the light bulbs were out, and I went up in, in Cross Campus Library, I went up to my friend Mark, who was my roommate, and I said, Mark, we need to get some light bulbs. And he said, don't bother me, Claire, I have more important things to think about than light bulbs. To which I said, so do I. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> so, so, so that's a, you know, I, I, I think, but somebody has to think about the light bulbs. I guess, I guess if, if I hadn't, but many didn't seem to notice the darkness. <laughs> anyway. From the beginning then, but briefly, I was born into an ordinary family in a town an hour up the coast from Boston called Manchester by the Sea. The 60s were barely a ripple there at the end of the Boston commuter line. It must have been our perfect beach, called Singing Beach on account of its fine, pale, musical sand, but perhaps also because it is so widely and so long lauded that afforded me my delusions of grandeur. It makes sense 
that if you stand almost daily in the middle of a perfect crescent of shore with a vista open to eternity, you'll conceive of possibility differently from someone raised in a wooded valley or among the canyons of a big city. Or maybe, more likely, they came from my mother, fierce and strange and doomed. I had a mother and a father, a big brother, eight years bigger than me, though, so we hardly seemed in the same family. By the time I was nine, he was gone. And a tortoiseshell cat, Zipper, and a mangy, runty mutt from the shelter named Sputnik, who looked like a wig of rags on sticks. His legs were so scrawny, we marveled they didn't snap. My father worked in insurance in Boston. He took the train each morning, the 752, and he proceeded very respectably, but apparently not very successfully, because my parents never seemed to have money to spare. My mother stayed home and smoked cigarettes and hatched schemes. For a while, she tested cookbook recipes for a publisher. She was paid for it, and for months, she fed us elaborate three- and four-course meals that involved eggy sauces and frequently, as I recall, Marsala wine. <laughs> Briefly and humiliatingly for me, she fancied herself a clothes designer and spent several months at the sewing machine in the spare room in a swoon of tobacco smoke. Often, she held a cigarette between her lips while running a seam. I always worried that ash would fall onto the fabric. Her output was at once unusual and not unusual enough. She made paisley jersey mini dresses for girls of my size, not at first glance dissimilar to those off the rack. Come here, sugar plum, she'd call, and would hold up paper patterns against my prepubescent chest, trimming away carelessly at the paper with her enormous shears, a mere whisper from my waist or my neck. But then you'd see she'd cut portholes around the midriff and etch them with rickrack so that a girl's white tummy would peer through, or that she'd made the sleeves so they attached not with seams but with a flurry of ribbons, a circle of multicolored bows that would look bedraggled after a single washing. Cheerfully impractical, she ran up at least two dozen outfits of various designs the summer I was nine, and then took a booth from which to flog them at the fair in a neighboring town. <coughs> I refused to sit with her there in full view on a brilliant Saturday in July and went instead with my father on a tedious round of errands the cleaners, the liquor store, the hardware store, stifling in the car, but immeasurably relieved not to risk being seen by my schoolmates under my mother's hideous handmade sign. My mother was a beloved embarrassment. She sold a few of the clothes, but clearly felt the experiment hadn't sufficiently succeeded and the suitcase was stowed, unemptied, in the attic. Before too long, the sewing machine also migrated upward and my mother entered one of her darker phases until the next eureka moment struck. Certainly my mother, unlike my father, instilled in me the sense that unpredictability was essential. Not to be like your neighbor, that is everything, she would say. And because of this, because of the bright flame of her, it took me a long time to realize that she too was cautious and bourgeois, frightened of the unknown and so uncertain of herself that she could hardly bear to make a mark. How else could she have stayed resolutely wedded to the ordinary, to my father, to the carefully ordained and unchanging routines of Manchester by the sea? And it explains much about me, too, about the limits of my experience, about the fact that the person I am in my head is so far from the person I am in the world. Nobody would know me from my own description of myself, which is why, when called upon, rarely I grant to provide an account, I tailor it, I adapt. I try to provide an outline that can, in some way, correlate to the outline that people understand me to have, that I suppose I actually have at this point. But who I am in my head, very few people really get to see that. Almost none. It's the most precious gift I can give to bring her out of hiding. Maybe I've learned it's a mistake to reveal her at all. So from our ordinary family in our ordinary house, a center entrance colonial with its potted geraniums on the stone porch and its charmingly untended yew hedges nibbling at the windows, I made my way out into the ordinary world, to the local elementary school, the local middle school, the local high school. I was popular enough, universally liked by the girls, even liked when noticed by the boys, though not in a romantic way. I was funny, ha-ha, not peculiar. It was a modest currency like pennies, pedestrian, somewhat laborious, but a currency nonetheless. I was funny in public, most often at my own expense. Education was different then, and I was good at it, and so I skipped grade nine, went straight from eight to 10, which was socially a little tough at first, and sealed my fate as a disastrous math student. I never learned the quadratic formula and other important tips from ninth grade math. Just like I missed the early dating essays and the classes in how to navigate a school dance. At the time, though, I wasn't embarrassed about any of this. Not embarrassed to be thrown sink or swim into the second year of high school without so much as a map to the cafeteria or a primer on how cliques were lined up, or even a list of the names of my new classmates, all of whom knew one another, and some of whom knew me as their little sister's friend. No, I was proud, because I knew my parents were proud, because it was an elevation and a revelation of the fact that I was special. I long suspected it, 
and now I knew for sure I was destined. When you're a girl, you never let on that you're proud or that you know you're better at history or biology or French than the girl who sits beside you and is 18 months older. Instead, you gush about how good she is at putting on nail polish or talking to boys, and you roll your eyes at the vaunted difficulty of the history, biology, French test and say, oh my god, it's going to be such a disaster. I'm so scared. And you put yourself down whenever you can so that people won't feel threatened by you, so they'll like you, because you wouldn't want them to know that in your heart you are proud, maybe even haughty, and are riven by thoughts, the revelation of which would show everyone how deeply not nice you are. You learn a whole other polite way of speaking to the people who mustn't see you clearly, and you know you get told by others that they think you're really sweet, and you feel a thrill of triumph. Yes, I'm good at history, biology, French, and I'm good at this, too. It doesn't even occur to you, as you fashion your mask so carefully, that it will grow into your skin and graft itself and come to seem irremovable. When you look at the boy Josh, who skipped the grade alongside you, <clears throat> and you see him wiping his nose upon his sleeve, and note his physical scrawniness, his chin's bloom of acne next to the other 10th grade boys with broader chests and clear square jaws. When you observe that he still takes his lunch with his old 9th grade friends, all of them boys in black t-shirts with glitter decals across the breast that say KISS or ACDC, all of them with pimply chins and wet lips and hair as like as seaweed, you cannot see any triumph in him at all. He seems clearly to have lost, to be lost, to be a loser, because anybody knows that in the challenge you were given when you skipped a grade, social success, modest social success, to be sure, but still, was half the battle. When Frederica Beatty invites you to join her birthday party, a sail on her father's boat with six other girls, two of whom are from the most popular set, you feel pity for Josh, who will never taste such nectar. But wait. Nobody ever pointed out that Josh, in his obliviousness, was utterly happy. He'd already taught himself the quadratic formula. He wouldn't be stymied in any area of academic advancement. In fact, he would go on to MIT and eventually become a neurobiologist with a lab largely funded by the NIH and a vast budget at his disposal. <laughs> he would marry a perfectly attractive and rather knock-kneed woman and spawn several knock-kneed bespectacled nerds, replicas of himself. It will all work out more than fine for him and he will never for a second suspect that it could have been otherwise. He will not know there was a social test. He will not know that he failed it. No, a sail on Frederick Abidi's father's boat was an honor that he dreamed not of. And his yen for society, such as it was, was perfectly satisfied by his old clan now a year behind him. He could no more have fashioned a mask than flown to the moon. And so he remained who he was forevermore. Femininity as masquerade, indeed. If anybody needs to go, feel free. And if anybody has a question, yes, ma'am. Um, was French your first language? And do you how many other languages do you speak? And, and how does that influence you in your writing? French was not my first language. Um, English was my first language. My father was French. Um, and uh, we we learned we we for a long time. What I knew how to say in French was. Grand-mère, est-ce que je peux quitter la table, s'il te plaît? Because that was the most important thing for me to know. Um, and then at some point when I was about nine, I, I went to a French school for a, a few years. Um, and I could lie and say I can speak German and Italian, but that would really be a lie. I, I know a little tiny wee bit of both of those. Um, I certainly, I, th I think one thing that is true is that I, I grew up as somebody once said long ago in various Commonwealth countries. Um, <laughs> I was a kid in Australia and then in Canada and, and then we moved to the States uh, when I was a teenager. And I think uh, I, I have a sort of funny sense of, of English because of that, that there are words, sort of slang words or particular words that are Canadian or Australian or British, my husband's British, that, you know, or American, right? But, but that you feel there isn't one exactly the same and um, I remember I think it was the last book and I had the word singlet and my editor said you have to take it out and I said well, well what will be there instead and she said wife beater <laughs> I felt like mm, that's not really what I meant <laughs> so, so I, I think you know there, and, and there's certainly um, that happens you know with French too that there, there are expressions that, that don't 
uh, that you think of, you know, that you, many of them are, are just used in English, of course, now, but, 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 um, but some of them not. Yes, sir. Today I told my brother-in-law that I would be coming to your view. He sent me the snippet of the Salon <laughs> interview, which maybe some people here have also read online. Could you um, elaborate on that? I had a feeling that though you gave a full punch paragraph, you might have elaborated even more. Even more. Or maybe they only printed it. <clears throat> was this originally NPW and then Salon grabbed it? Yes, it was NPW. And it was actually done by email. So so that oh, okay. they, they did put, you know, do you know what she edited? Her own question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, 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 uh, so for those of you who aren't aware of, of this, little exchange, um, the, the, uh, I did a, a Q&A with a, a reviewer from PW about the book, and she asked me the question, she said, I, I wouldn't want to be friends with Nora, would you? Her outlook on life is almost unbearably grim. But, um, but in fact, the original question said, nor would I want to be friends with anybody else in this book, uh, except maybe that kid. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I detected, a, a, I detected a, a sort of note of hostility, I have to say. So, um, so, so that perhaps um, maybe uh, <clears throat> influenced my response a little. And my, my response was to, to, to uh, I did say, for heaven's sake, what kind of question is that? Um, and, and then I, I listed some protagonists uh, beloved pr protagonists of literature over the centuries with whom you, well, she might want to be friends, but not me. Um, you know, Humbert Humbert, Hamlet, uh, Antigone, uh, Raskolnikov, uh, Oscar Wilde, uh, Salim Sinai, you know, etc., etc. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think there, and then at the end I said, it's not, you know, the question isn't, is this a potential friend for me, but is this character alive? Um, I, I don't, you know, uh, I, I gave a reading last night and somebody in the audience uh, put up her hand and said, what is this about? We had the women's movement and we sorted everything out. <laughs> um, and, uh, to, and then we had a discussion about that fact. I was interested because I couldn't remember whether 70s feminism, what wave that had been, and she said wave two. And I said, so wave one was the blue stockings, and she said yes, and I said, so what was Mary Wollstonecraft? And she said, that was before. <laughs> so, um, but, but, but I think what's complicated is, 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 is there are so, uh, you know, I, I think many of our, our preconceptions about things are so, uh, unconscious and, and imbricated in our in our understanding of the world that, that we don't even know they're there. And I, I, I don't actually think that the question of likability is one that is asked of male authors. I don't think there's an assumption uh, by male readers uh, that they should like their the characters. And I don't think there's an assumption by female readers that they should like male characters. And I think there, there is some assumption afoot, perhaps only laterally, perhaps only in certain quarters, perhaps it isn't as, as, as threatening as one fears, uh, that, that women readers should, should identify with, and God forbid, admire, admire uh, female characters, which, which, uh, which I'm sure there's much to say about. Uh, it's a sort of interesting phenomenon, but but I think uh, would spell literary disaster. Um, I'm thinking about that quote, that famous quote from the feminists of the <coughs> 70s, if one woman were to tell the truth about her life, the world would split open. Um, but I was also thinking about, as you were reading, because I haven't read it yet, but I'm, I'm um, struck by even your anecdote about the, the man that you lived with at college, um, that so many of these, when you're a mother, as you are, um, you, you rub up against a lot of this every day, the, the, the issues of inequality and the rage that you feel about, about being sort of trapped, sometimes with children, I hate to say. 
uh, but true. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wondered about your impulse, uh, uh, at your decision to make her childless, and how that happened. Mm -hmm. um, it, it certainly wasn't in any way, as somebody asked, was it to make a point about single life? And, and it wasn't it, at all. Uh, I, that arose out of my uh, the aforementioned interest in the interior life. And the fact that when you, well, I suppose you could in some simple way say, when you have children, you, you lose your interior life. <laughs> but but, but uh, a perhaps less drastic way of of saying it would, would be that when you when you live in any sort of uh, group situation, uh, whatever sort of family or, or 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 intimate situation you might be in, you you come up against reality checks that that keep you from uh, spinning too elaborate an internal web. At some point, you're just going to come up against the fact that it isn't true, and uh, when when you're on your own. Certainly, I, within 24 hours, when on my own, can start, you know, making up. I don't know what. Um, so, so that that was that was the uh, the the sort of driving impulse behind that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that when you started writing, you knew you were writing something that could be kind of unacceptable to critics or readers, and I wonder if you could just elaborate on on the, on, on that feeling and whether you felt doubt or. In the voice, or I didn't feel any doubt in the voice, and, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, that it, you know, I, I, I think I was un, I was actually probably unaware of the of the degree to which I I had parameters, I had created uh, parameters for what it was possible for me to do, um, and we we all do that in. in in different ways, and and uh, in in the past, uh, my my last book came out right before I turned forty, and um, and then you know sort of I I have I have well I'm here right mm -hmm. I've I've withstood the slings and arrows a little bit um, there's there's been a lot of death uh, around me and uh, that and getting older you you just realize. You know the sniper's on the roof, and there isn't a lot of time. And if there are things you think you'd like to do, do them now. So if, if you're out there and you're say in your 20s, I would say don't wait till you're 40 to have that realization. Do them now. Um, and 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 so I I I have I had at no time any doubt about Nora's voice. Um, I had no doubt about Nora, and it puts me um, in this fantastic position that. I really don't give a shit what Michiko Kakutani is. I really don't give a shit. Because you know what? You know what? If she says it's schematic, she's wrong. I have never written anything so heartfelt, you know? And I just, I, it's an incredible liberation to feel, I, um, you know, and writing about a character who, who is seeking approval from outside, who isn't able to find it within herself, to feel that I'm actually at a point where, you know, I have my own approval. It's okay. And and let 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 the chips fall where they may. Yeah. Um, so with this idea of voice and also your intention to write the angry woman, did you with that opening portion and that immediate introduction to the internal angry rant? Did you have to work with that voice or no, ma'am? Okay, so there was no. somebody said to me, D "Did you have trouble accessing that anger?" <laughs> no, <ma 'am. laughs> no, none whatsoever. <laughs> I, I had to rewrite it after, but you know, and trim it down was a little long. So. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, was there anything about Nora that surprised you in the process of writing the book? You know, I, I think uh, yes, she surprised me in, a, in in at various times, uh, in various ways. Some some good, some less good. I feel that she uh, she makes. Uh, choices that aren't smart and that she knows better than to make and she makes them anyway and uh, and and yet I came to feel absolutely certain that those were the choices she would have made um, and and you know to hark back to to notes from underground 
you know, that's precisely about our perversity, human, humanity's perversity, and the fact that we, uh, we all constantly make choices that it isn't good for us to make. But I also felt that she was stronger than I had initially uh, imagined that she was. Um, I, I have a question about the name, Nora. I wondered, um, it's a very common name in Irish families, and I want, and many of the, I haven't read the book yet, but many of the characteristics that you have um, described tonight can be found in, <laughs> in Irish people. And so I wondered if there was any connection. To that. I, I have no Irish, uh, I, I love the name Nora. My sister had in college a really good friend named Nora, and I always wished that I, had been called Nora, or had known somebody called Nora. It seemed incredibly a lovely name, um, but 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 I I think that possibly, and it may not be the Irish uh, aspect that you mean, but 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 one thing you you may not know about her is she's a stealth Catholic, and I think uh, I, I think uh, that that does I think that does inform uh, a worldview. You know, I, I my my uh, father's family <clears throat> is. Well, was they're all gone, um, Catholic, and uh, and I had uh, an aunt, uh, my father's only sibling, who 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 did that job of staying home and taking care of her parents, and uh, <clears throat> and and I think, you know, in various cultures that happens over over centuries that happened uh, a great deal. Uh, but but it's it, it's still uh, it's still an important role I think in in certain places and in certain worlds and if if you if you come from a world where that isn't something that people do um, <coughs> then then I think probably aspects of Nora might seem more alien I, I mean I, I think there are, well I probably probably. You might come from any number of places and find her alien. I don't know, but but uh, but but certainly in my understanding of her, that that abandoned underpinning of her life is is part. Of her. I just want to ask a superficial question: Who will play Nora in the movie version? Because <laughs> I can't think of any other forty-two-year-old actress or any forty-two-year-old actress that could pull it off. What do you think? You just ask in the crowd. It's a shame Judy Davis is too old. Um, maybe we could just shift it around, a bit, you know. But but in in it, 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 this just puts me in mind. I don't know if you remember last fall when Vogue magazine did that feature on Edith Wharton, and and had all the male writers, and then had Edith Wharton played by a Russian supermodel. Yeah. So um, you know maybe maybe if if we make a movie, we can just have a Russian supermodel. That would work out too. <laughs> then people might come see it. <laughs> Yes. You talked about the concepts that he started with as you were figuring out the book. How closely did the character come to the concept um, before you actually started work on it? Well, um, you know, I'm also, there was also, there were also characters who I haven't told you about, you know, people I have come across. Um, who are still living and therefore not mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, so there was the magpie thing of a little bit from this person I I I've met and a little bit from this person I know and you know and so on, um, and and putting those together, and and in some way, uh, in some way I'm going to tell you a truth. It's all a little bit pretend to talk about it afterwards, because when you're doing it, you just do it. And, and you don't really know why you do it or how you do it. And then afterwards people say, well, what did you do and why did you do it? And then you make up some answers. <laughs> <laughs> when you, you had this idea of a ranter and of writing a book about anger, did you go back and reread the books that you talked about, the Notes from Underground and the Thomas Bernard's and Sabbath State, or did you stay away from them so they wouldn't crowd you? Um, uh, no, I didn't go reread re things. Although, as some people here know, I, there are some of those books I teach every so often. So, so then I, you know, reread them for teaching. But, but um, no, I didn't. I, I didn't reread them in in um, 
if I tell you all a secret, will you not, will you not repeat it? <laughs> um, you know, a, a bunch of people have said, oh, and, and Nora, the, the name of Nora is deliberately a, a reference to Ibsen. Well, I, you know, um, it had been 15 years since I saw a doll's house and, you know, kind of knocked me over with a feather when, uh, when and I was like, yes, of course, <laughs> totally, absolutely, right on. Um, I, maybe some Jungian collective subconscious was a foot, you know, to, to make that, mm, yes, absolutely a reference. I have the memory of a flea, yeah. <laughs> When do you write and do you have like rituals that you do before you really hunker down and stuff like that? Gosh, that makes it sound so organized, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, when do I write? Almost never. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 used, I used to, sometimes I do have, you know, I, we, we, we had a fellowship year in Germany and I had this little office and I went there every day and I um, wrote like the Dickens. And, um, and in, in regular life, especially in these, you know, since children, but then in the past years with ailing parents, um, there would be stretches, sometimes three months, you know, where you just, you couldn't do that. Um, and, and, um, and so now I feel like if I can get a, a few days a week, I'm good, that's, that's, that's good. Um, sometimes a few days a week is, is, you know, an hour one day, you know. It, it, it isn't, I, I, I remember when I was an MFA student and um, my professor said to the class, if you're not writing at least four hours a day, you're not writing, and I, I think they're, you know, by that s standard, I've pretty rarely been, <laughs> been a writer. Uh, but I, 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 I don't need, I don't need sort of special things except a, a special pen and a special pad, and then I can be anywhere as long as my children aren't there. <laughs> Nora's grip on, on reality. Um, how close do you think she is, at least in terms of descriptions of events? And, and just, I, was, I was really, um, because of course she has a, a kind of a tenuous grip on, on reality in terms of how he's interpreting that the Chinese and, and so on. But in terms of what actually happened, do you think um, she's describing what is empirically fairly close, or is she imagining much of the interaction? Oh no, she's not crazy. No. <laughs> she's not crazy. As she says, she's angry, she's not crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, huh. Interesting. Sometimes she's telling the story. Yeah, interesting. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe there is one. Yes. Where do you teach? Where do I teach? Hunter. Hunter. A very wonderful MFA program with very wonderful students, some of whom are here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.